So the first style of proof we're going to look at is deductive reasoning. It's one you've seen before, basically it's geometry is all deductive reasoning. It's probably the most common type of proof you've seen so far. So what we said was an argument is valid or logically valid if and only if it takes a form that makes it impossible, so it's got to be impossible for all the premises to be true and then the conclusion false. Because right? if all the premises are true, the conclusion must be true for the proof to be good. Right. So direct proof, known as, there's the Latin, modus ponens. Modus ponens. That technically, using our symbolic notation, is what we're doing. What we're saying is if we have these conditions, if we prove that P implies Q, so we've proven that to be true, and then we also have P, then we must have Q. So we're not directly saying P implies Q, we're saying if we can prove P implies Q, and we've got P, then we can conclude we've got Q. So that's the idea of a direct proof using the logic notation. Now I'm going to prove this is logically valid because what I should be able to do is it doesn't matter whether P or Q are true and false. When I sub it into the truth table, every single possibility should come out to be true. And if that's the case, then this is a solid proof. This will always work. So let's fill in our truth table. So there's the possibilities. There's only four this time because we're only talking about two of our uh, statements. All right, let's fill down the P's and Q's. There's no negations there. So basically I'm just filling down those trues and falses. We work from inside out. So P implies Q. Well, that was what we saw. The only one that was false is true implies false. Because right, remember the logically valid, what we just said was impossible for the conclusion to nevertheless be false. Well, so if we get true being false, then that's no good. All the others are fine. It's the true implying false, which is no good. Okay, so that gives us that one. So let's work out. Now I've got to join it with the and. So I'm looking at the, the P value here and the blue ones. So true and true, true and false, false and true, false and true. That gives us this. So we get true, false, false and false. The only one of those is true would be the true and true. Okay, so now I finish it off and I'm hoping all of these will turn out to be true. But I'm now working with the green one and the Q column. So I've got true implies true, that's certainly right. False implies false, that's good. False implies true, that one's okay. Remember the only one that's no good is true implies false. And I've got false implies false. So yep, they will come out to be true. So this is a solid method of proof. We know this to be logically valid if we can do it. This is sort of uh, joining different proofs together. Because what I'm saying here is, well, if I know P implies Q, know that to be true, and I know Q implies R, well then it's logical, I can conclude that P implies R. Because P implies the Q, Q implies the R, P implies the R. All right, let's do some. Prove that if a number is odd, then its square is also odd. So I'm gonna let n be an odd integer. That's what we're working with, odd integers. So n is an odd integer. And the way I would write that down and using notation, I'm saying, well, n equals 2k plus one. I could do 2k minus one, doesn't really matter. But where k is an integer, that will always create an odd number. Square both sides, because I want to prove that its square is also odd. So n squared is 2k plus 1 all squared. Expand that out. Remember, I'm trying to show this to be in the format of an odd number, which I've defined to be 2k plus 1, or 2 times an integer plus 1. So I rewrite that expansion to be 2 times 2k squared plus 2k plus 1. Now 2k squared plus 2k is the interesting bit. Is that an integer? Well, if I square an integer, I will get an integer. When two times that is going to be an integer, add two times, yeah, that will always be an integer. So yes, this is two times an integer, which I'll just call capital P. So yes, it is 2P plus 1, where P is this particular expression, but I know that is an integer. There's your direct proof. And there's the conclusion. Well, hence, if n is odd, n squared must also be odd. Here's one from 
two HSCs ago. Two HSCs. We're going to prove that 2 to the power of n plus 3 to the power of n does not equal 5 to the power of n for all integers greater than or equal to 2. Well, let's start with this expression. I'm going to change the 5 and the 2 plus 3. Kind of made sense because you got 2 and 3 there. So 5 to the power of n is equal to 2 plus 3 to the power of n. Now using our binomial theorem, I know I could expand that out, like so. nc0, 2 to the power of n, and then as we go along, the powers of 2 go down by 1, powers of 3 go up by 1, and we have all those binomial coefficients in front of them. Now we're trying to show that this is not equal to 2 to the power of n plus 3 to the power of n. Well, that has to be greater than 2 to the power of n plus 3 to the power of n, because have a look at what we've got. The very first term is nc0, which is 1, times 2 to the power of n. The very last term is ncn, which is 1, times 3 to the power of n. But we've got all these terms in the middle. Now, they've got a value, but not just any value. They've got a positive value. So I must have something bigger than just the two n ones added together. But it's only true for n greater than or equal to 2. Because if n was equal to 1, what would happen? Well, I, I wouldn't have these middle terms anymore. They'd be gone, because if n was uh, 1, then have a look at my original expansion. Well, that would just simply be 2 plus 3 to the power of 1, which is 5. And 5 to the power of 1 is 5, so it's actually equal to for, for 1. No good. So yeah, it, if it's greater than for all of those 1s greater than or equal to 2, then it can't be equal to. So another direct proof. Prove that the sum of the squares of 5 consecutive integers is divisible by 5. Now, just a little theorem, I guess, if you like, but something we need to realise, that if P and Q are integers, they belong to the integers, and we know Q is divisible by P, then there must exist a value such that Q is equal to P times N. And because we're saying this times this would be that. It's divisible. I'm going to let Q equal this expression here, the sum of consecutive integers, but I've chosen those numbers very carefully. It would have been simple enough to just go, oh, I've got n, n plus 1, n plus 2, n plus 3, and so on. But if I use symmetry to my advantage, it becomes easier. So if the middle one's n, then I can go n minus 2, n minus 1, n, n plus 1, n plus 2. They're five consecutive integers. But the advantage of doing that, I can add these a lot easier now because all of those middle terms are going to cancel. Because you know, the minus one's going to have minus 2ab. The plus one will have plus 2ab. So the minus 2ab and the 2ab cancels, and I'm just left with the a squared and the b squared. So I'm going to have five n squareds. They're all going to produce n squared, but then I'm going to have the last term squared. So uh, negative two squareds, four. Negative one squareds, one. Uh, that one doesn't have one. One squared is one. Two squared is four. So I've now got this expression. Let's add it together. Well, that's five n squared plus 10. I can factorise 5 out, so now the key is, can I be confident that n squared plus 2 is an integer? Uh, and yeah, it is, because n's an integer, we defined that. There it is in the first line, we defined that. So we square an integer, we know we get an integer, add 2, yep, it's still an integer. And I guess that's the key when you are setting out your proof, not leaving out these little things like defining n is an integer. It's only because n is an integer that in this last line I can say p is an integer. So I need that in my proof. I've got to define that. So, yep, the sum of the squares of five consecutive integers is indeed divisible by five. That brings me to proof by contraposition. So this is the one we haven't seen before. This is known as modus tollens. Modus tollens. And it's basically the idea we talked about yesterday. Contraposition is where we go and prove the negated one, the contrapositive, because sometimes that's easier. 
we're going to prove that if 2 to the power of n minus 1 is prime, then n has to be a prime number. So notice n in this case is a natural number. So we say it's got to be a positive number. And it can't be zero. All right, I'm going to let n be p times q. Now p and q are going to be natural numbers, uh, but they're not going to be equal to 1 because we know p and q are not Sorry, we know 1 is not a prime number, and I want primes here. So what I'm basically saying is n ends up not being a prime number. Because yeah? again, if p or q was equal to 1, I'd have a prime number, definition of a prime number. Exactly two factors, 1 and itself. So if neither of those is 1, then I can't have a, a prime number. So 2 to the power of n minus 1, but I've just said n is pq. So 2 to the power of pq minus 1. Well, that's 2 to the power of p or to the power of q, just you play with my index laws, minus 1. Now I'm going to use my factorization. Remember the a to the power of n minus b to the power of n? The generalization of our difference of two squares, difference of two cubes. You always start with what it looks like. So I'm going to start with 2 to the power of p minus 1. And then the next one, the powers, although I've sort of written it backwards, but the powers of 2 will go down by 1. The powers of 1, well, they're all 1, but they will go up by 1. So that's in the second. So I've got it written as two factors. Well, that equals pq. So there are my two factors. My two factors are going to be 2 to the power of p minus 1. Well, that does not equal 1. Can't equal 1, because remember we said p can't equal 1. So therefore, we can't have a situation of 2 minus 1, which is 1. So that's all right. We know p's not 1. What about q? Well, q equals 1 plus... 2 to the power of p, 2 to the power of 2p, and so on. Well, if it's 1 plus all these things, it's got to be bigger than 1. So q can't equal 1 as well. And that's got to be true for all p and q, which are natural numbers. So in other words, we've just shown that's not prime. So if n is not prime, that's what I did up here, that's what I assumed, then we've just proven that 2 to the power of n minus 1 is not prime. So if that is true, then, hence, if 2 to the power of n minus 1 is prime, then n is prime by contraposition. Those last two words are really, really important. I guess it's a bit like the induction, how we say, well, by induction, we've induced the solution. That's the same thing here. How did you jump from here to here? Oh, well, by contraposition. That's how I jumped from there to there. So you let them know. That's part of your proof. By contraposition, I did this. Last year's HSC. Prove that for all integers greater than or equal to 3, if 2 to the power of n minus 1 is prime, they love prime numbers, then n cannot be even. So let n be an even number. So I'm going to do this by contraposition. So it's an even number. So this time I'm going to say n is equal to 2 times an integer, but my integer is going to be greater than or equal to 2. Greater than or equal to 2. Why 2? Hmm. What do the questions say? Uh, for all, ah, there we go. For all integers n greater than or equal to 3. Uh, so therefore, the first one has to be 4, doesn't it? Because if I want even numbers, it's so k greater than or equal to 2. So 2 to the power of n minus 1 would equal, sub in the 2, uh, 2k. 2 to the power of 2k minus 1. Difference of two squares. So 2 to the power of k minus 1, 2 to the k plus 1. So a bit like that last one. If I'm trying to show something is prime or, or not prime in this case, uh, then I need two factors. And, and I need to be able to show that neither of those factors is 1, and then I've got a composite rather than a, a prime. So 2 to the power of k minus 1, 2 to the power of k plus 1. Now we know 2 to the power of k plus 1 must be bigger than 2 to the power of k minus 1. So if one of those is going to equal 1, it has to be the 2 to the power of k minus 1. Now I suppose, logically, 2 to the power of k plus 1, well that's not going to be 1 anyway, because you're adding something to, to 1. Now 2 to the power of k minus 1, well that's got to be greater than or equal to 2 to the power of 4 minus 1, which is 3. Now, how can I just make this statement? Well that's where we explain ourselves, reminding everyone that, hang on, because you remember we said k was greater than or equal to 2. So that allows me to make this statement. Well if it's 3, It's got two different factors, I've just got it that it's two different factors, and neither of those factors is one. 
So it's a composite number. So what I've just done is, if n is an even number, then 2 to the power of n minus 1 is not a prime number. Now let's use the contraposition. Hence, if 2 to the power of n minus 1 is a prime number, then n is not even by contraposition. Ooh, okay, let's see how we go. Proof by contradiction, we have seen before. This one is so much more fun in Latin. Reductio ad impossible. Right? It's what we call an indirect proof as opposed to a direct proof. And there is the logical breakdown for it. This is what we're saying with a proof by contradiction. If we have the negation of P implies Q, okay, so P implies Q, no. If we know that that implies that we get both R and not R, remember we said it has to be true or false, it can't be both, but one of those has got to be true and one of those has got to be false. Okay, so they, that's our contradiction. Well, that implies then that what I started with can't be right. So I must have P implies Q. So that's basically the proof by contradiction. Let's prove that this one's always true uh, using our truth table. So let's fill them in. There are all the possibilities. Now, the one R, well, I filled in the R and the not R straight away because obviously that's false. Oh, they're always false. You can't have both. Let's now fill down the other ones. There's P and Q over there. So true, true, false, false, and so on. Just copy them down. We work inside out. Well, let's do that one over there. P implies Q. Um, they're all true, except true implies false. You can't have true implies false. That's got to be false. Okay. What about the negation? Well, the negation of that one would change the value. So that goes false, true, false, false. So now, where do we go? Okay, we've got to work in here. So it's this column and this first purple column here. We've got false implies false, true implies false, false implies false, and false implies false. So the only one that's false is the true implies false. You can't have that. So now I'm going with, which one? Is it the green one? And the second purple one. So true implies true, that's true. False implies false, that's true. True implies true, that's true. True, but yes, they're all true. So, yep, proof by contradiction is a solid way of proving something. Let's do this one. We're going to prove that log 5 base 2 is indeed an irrational number. So I will assume the opposite. I'm going to assume that log 5 base 2 actually is a rational number. Well, if it's rational, I can rewrite it as P over Q, where P and Q are co-prime. Remember, co-prime just means that they have no common factor. So 2 to the power of P on Q would equal 5, if I rearrange that. Well, if that's true, then 2 to the power of P equals 5 to the power of Q. But hang on. The left-hand side is even, because if you raise an even number to a power, you get an even number. And as we saw earlier, if you raise an odd number to a power, you get an odd number. So the right number's odd. Well, there's your contradiction. <laughs> they can't equal each other. Hence, the uh, log 5 must be irrational. Well, I suppose I should say by contradiction, but I, I guess I mentioned contradiction in the line before. So somewhere in there I mentioned, you know, we've got our contradiction. Prove that there are no integers a and b such that 18a plus 6b is equal to 1. It would be impossible to substitute integers into that and come up with an answer of 1. Can't do it. So we will assume that actually there does exist a and b, and they've got to be integers, that when I substitute it into that, I get the answer 1. I'm going to assume that to be true. Let's play around with it. So 18a plus 6b equals 1. It's got a common factor of 6. So I'll pull that out. So 3a plus b would equal 1 6. Well, hang on. 3a plus b is got to be an integer, because we said a was an integer, b was an integer. So 3 times a plus b got to be an integer, but I'm saying it's equal to 1, 6. Well, that's not an integer. Well, it can't equal 1, 6. So we've got a contradiction. I've got one line where I'm saying it is an integer, and I've got another line where it says it's not an integer. Contradiction. Thus, it doesn't happen. There are no integers such that that is equal to 1. 2020 HSC. The proposition is this, if k plus 1 is divisible by 3, then k cubed plus 1 is divisible by 3. What they first said was prove the proposition is true. Now, I, I think I did mine directly. 
So K, I'm going to let k plus 1 is equal to 3p. p is an integer for all k, which is also integers. In other words, what I'm saying is if I sub an integer into that, 3 times p, p is also going to be an integer. k cubed plus 1, we know our standard factorization for that. There it is. Well, k plus 1, I said was 3p. So I've got a factor of 3. Well, straight away, I know it's divisible by 3. Because k squared minus k plus 1 has to be an integer. And p we defined as an integer. So, yep, did that bit. Write down the contrapositive of our proposition. Okay? Read it back. So our contraposition would be if k plus 1 is not divisible by 3, then k plus 1 is not divisible by 3. There's your contraposition. Write down the converse of the proposition P. Remember converse was the backwards of it? And state with reasons whether the converse is true or false. Okay, my converse therefore would be if K plus 1 is divisible by 3, then K plus 1 is divisible by 3. That would be the converse. Is it true or false? So we know, because it said give reasons, we know P implies Q is equivalent to the contraposition. Now, that's what I've written down there. Now, if I make P the statement, KQ plus 1 is divisible by 3, and Q is the statement, K plus 1 is divisible by 3. We know, remember, KQ uh, plus 1 is that. I can now play around with this and get that that is k plus 1 and the second factor I'm going to call k plus 1 squared minus 3. So if k plus 1 is not divisible by 3, then neither is k plus 1 squared. Thus, k plus 1 squared minus 3k is not divisible by 3, which means that the whole thing is not divisible by 3. So if k plus 1 is not divisible by 3, then k cubed plus 1 is not divisible by 3. Contraposition, we have it. Okay, we'll add those to our list.